Number 10. Hal Jordan recreates Coast City So let's take this Hal going parallax thing from a different angle. Let's go back to the beginning of the descent, and this occurs after Coast City is destroyed during the death of Superman, reign of Superman stuff. So Coast City, where his family lived, gone. 7 million dead when Mongol detonated a bomb, but it turned out he had been ordered to do it by Hank Henshaw, Cyborg Superman. Hal had been in space at the time, so returned to find it destroyed, and this completely unhinged him, just the guilt of it. And after it was all settled, he was so rattled, he tried to use his ring to recreate the city. He obviously could not do it. But this was the beginning of the instability, and a sign that he was cracking. That's a creepy abuse of ring power that hadn't been thought through. You know, first you're recreating cities that you just have to sit in the entire time, just holding the construct up. Then you're growing Reed Richards' hair streaks. Next thing you know, you're killing the entire Green Lantern Corps and blowing up in the sun. It's the natural progression of these things. But don't worry, he was possessed, so none of it counts. Number 9. Iron Man Sending Hulk Into Space So most people are vaguely aware of Planet Hulk, but did you know how he got there? Iron Man shot him into space in the lead up to Civil War. This is because him and some of his friends, Reed, felt that the Hulk was getting out of control. He was causing too much collateral damage, too many potential deaths, because Marvel has this thing that the Hulk never kills civilians, just, yeah. It's a modern thing and was a comics code thing before that. To that I say, sure Jan. No one's ever died in a Hulk rampage. Anyways, they felt they couldn't deal with him on Earth anymore. So why is this too far, you may ask? Are they wrong, you may be asking? Well, Marvel characters know that space is full of aliens. So it's fine for them to deal with the Hulk by just shooting him to space? where potentially other aliens can't stop him? That's Ice Cold Tony. This was the Tony going into Civil War though, so maximum douchery engaged. Number 8. Jean Grey outs Iceman Let's get controversial. Let's talk about an event people are oft times afraid to talk about. So Iceman in modern continuity is gay. This was accomplished via retcon that featured time travel. But here's the thing. This wasn't a reveal Bobby came to himself. In the issue wherein this is revealed, Bobby is conflicted about his sexuality. In fact, it appears more that he's leaning towards expressing bisexuality, which would have lined up with the past big female loves of his life, which were genuine. But then Jean Grey just reads his mind and goes, Bobby, you're gay. So she reads his mind, without his consent, then interpreted what she saw there through her own lens, then told him what he thought in his own mind based on what she saw. That's a big oof for me. Can we get some cringes in the chat, please? Yeah, many felt that this was a mishandling of what could have been a really big moment, and for some people, was a really big moment. But a lot of that got lost in the crutch of, if you don't like this, there's something wrong with you. It became a thing you couldn't talk about, and in some circles still can't. But no one silences me. I'll talk about what I want. Number 7. Jason Todd replaces Nightwing So Dan Didio has long had issues with Dick Grayson as Nightwing. He doesn't get it. He's like, he's not Robin, and he's not Batman. Whose man's is this? Flips table. So he wants two things. Well, either him dead or his name changed. Ideally both. But he got the name changed. That's why he's Rick Grayson now, which is pretty much the same thing as dead to me. Whoa, too much salt, I'm sorry. So in Infinite Crisis, Dick was supposed to die and Jason was going to become Nightwing. But the editors saved him and also writers protested. And so he got to live another day. But Jason was already Nightwing because this was pretty much a done deal. Dick Grayson's city had exploded while he was in it. He was dead. So Jason was also Nightwing for a bit and he was unhinged. He was killing people and tried to kill Dick. This was prime insane Jason when that was what we were doing with him. It was the continuation of the greatest regret angle before the black sheep angle. Jason was slicing people's throats, leaving blood notes on walls. It was all too far. Too much. Most people have blocked this arc from their memory along with that time that Jason was a tentacle monster. But I'll never forget. Number 6. Cyclops doesn't tell Jean about his wife. Let's talk about Cyclops and Jean. They are one of the iconic X-Men couples, but like Wanda and Vision, they have a pretty messed up history. After Jean died as Phoenix, before Phoenix was retconned to being a force and not her being mad with power, so basically the first parallax retcon, Scott would pick up with Madeline Pryor, a woman who looked strikingly similar to Jean. This would turn out to be because she was her clone. He married her, and the two had a son, Nathan Summers, or Nate Summers, who would grow up to become Cable after he was raised in the future. However, during all of this, Jean came back, and Scott was so thrilled he went to see her. But not only did he not tell his wife and newborn son where he was going, but he also didn't tell Jean he was married and had a kid. He would then go on to join X-Force all without telling Madeline. He would be spending the entire time convincing himself that this was the right thing to do. For many fans, this was the beginning of their hatred towards Cyclops, because he just does not come off well in this arc. Number 5. Batman puts Dick in traction This is from the Superman slash Batman crossover comic from 2003, about 54 issues in, where Batman and Superman swap powers and Batman goes a little nuts. He's just spending all his time 
time, non-stop crime fighting, chasing the knight across the globe. Dick eventually tries to take him down by waiting till he's been in the night for quite a while, so away from the sun and hence less powerful. But Dick can't take down a super powered Batman and he ends up getting horribly injured. Bruce attacks him, brutally crushing his jaw and nearly breaking his spine. The injuries are so horrific, Alfred doesn't know if he can forgive him, even if Bruce is less stable than usual because of all the powers. Batman smacks his Robins far more than I'd like, but when he does, it's always a <gasps> legasp moment. Let's talk about a word smack that many people forgot about in at number four. Number four, Green Arrow punches Speedy. This occurred in the famous Green Arrow Green Lantern team up comic with the cover, My Ward, a junkie, wherein Green Arrow, who has a very harsh stance on drugs, which is kind of the complete opposite of how he was portrayed for the rest of the series, which is very interesting. Because that series pitted Hal and Ollie against each other ideologically. Oftentimes, Ollie's the more leftist person who was just berating Hal constantly for being a space cop and doing what the Guardians tell him. But in this, when he discovers that Roy Harper is on drugs, he flips out. And Speedy goes, fine, hit me if it'll make you feel better. Guess you don't know everything. And so Ollie does hit him. He just can't handle it. How could someone under his tutelage be on drugs? He doesn't lift a finger to help him either. No, it's Black Canary and Hal who help him out and see that he gets the help that he needs. Then Ollie shows up and is all, oh, I'm sorry, I overreacted. Why does no one remember this? They remember the cover, but not the contents. Too far. Be better to your wards. Stop hitting them. Number three, Dick Grayson kills the Joker. This happened, for real, in canon, not an Elseworlds story. This happened in Joker's Last Laugh, a storyline wherein the Joker convinced everybody that he had a brain tumor and he decides that he's gonna go out in style. He's going ham. He creates crazy Joker rain, like falling from the sky. But Dick snaps when he finds Robin's, at the time Tim Drake's, costume shredded, and he's had enough at this point. Jason is dead, Barbara was paralyzed because of the Joker, for Tim to be gone too was just too much for him. Dick would proceed to beat the Joker to death, only for Tim and Batman to show up and for him to realize it was a ruse. He starts to have a breakdown, but Batman is able to restart the Joker's heart. But Dick killed him, that's over the line. I'm sure the people of Gotham would have been fine with it though. Just saying. Number two, Jean Grey and the Spider-Man Wolverine mind swap. This happened in the Ultimate Verse, the 1610. So here Wolverine was hitting on Jean, it was not appreciated, so she swapped his mind with the person he would least like to be swapped with, and that turned out to be Peter Parker. And while Wolverine was in Peter's body, he hit on MJ. Just the whole thing was too far. Jean can play pretty fast and loose with her powers. Poor Peter, he had no idea what was going on. He just woke up as Wolverine. I wouldn't want to wake up as Wolverine. He has lots of enemies. Also, everything would smell a lot. Also, hitting on MJ, gross. But I mean, Wolverine and Squirrel Girl, never forget. And number one, Ant-Man creeps on Carol Danvers. Now this Ant-Man isn't Hank Pym, and it's not Scott Lang. So get ready to get out your tortures and pitchforks for someone new. This is Eric O'Grady. And this happened in the irredeemable Ant-Man. So well, they named it right. This Ant-Man is just a creeper, and his thing is spun on girls in the shower. He does it to a woman he saves from a purse snatcher, follows her home, shrinks, and then he's creeping in the shower. Now, Eric wasn't supposed to have a suit. He was just a low-level shield agent, but he ended up getting his hands on one anyway, through a bit of a clandestine means kind. But he would fight crime, so it does count. And he would have a bit of a change of heart later on. We'll talk about that in a sec. So how did he end up peeping on Carol? Well, this was because he hid in a random woman's purse for shower purposes. And then when he gets out, it turns out that it is Carol Danvers. He spots eyes on her and takes pictures before she notices gross. Grady would later vow to change and become a better hero, but this this is hard to come back from. Look at his face in these panels. So those were 10 Number 10, Identity Crisis, Mind Wipe. So many heroes were involved in this, so many. Zatanna does the actual wiping, but Hawkman, Black Canary, The Flash, Elongated Man, Green Arrow, and Green Lantern all help and Superman knows about it. So Identity Crisis is a murder mystery that opens with the murder of Sue Dibney, the wife of the elongated man. As the story unfolds, we learn of a terrible event from the Justice League's history. One evening up on the watchtower, Sue Dibney was up there, and Dr. Light snuck up there. He sees her and rapes her, as the plot says to. So when the heroes come upon this, they decide it is so heinous, Zatanna should wipe his mind and alter his personality, so he never hurts someone like that again. While this is happening, Batman beams up and is horrified by what they were doing, so they mind wipe him too. This event leads to him becoming paranoid and distrustful, as he knows something happened but not what, and it turns Dr. Light into a brain addled idiot. So yeah, wiping someone's mind is definitely crossing a morality line, but wiping the mind of one of your closest allies
realized because they were calling you out on it, which probably means you should have thought about it more, definitely crossing the line. Number nine, Green Arrow and Cry for Justice. Cry for Justice in general went too far for many fans. This is the miniseries that infamously killed Leanne Harper, Roy Harper, Arsenal, formerly Speedy's daughter. Just for shock value, really. It was quite awful, and then she was retconned out of existence, so Roy could be a relatable teen with a baseball cap. Progress. Now the cap's backwards. Cry for Justice involved a couple of members of the Justice League, most notably Green Arrow and Green Lantern, who are friends despite not being able to stand each other, quitting the League to go after the Secret Society, which would put them on a collision course with Prometheus. This is the extreme cliff notes, by the way. Prometheus is like the inverse Batman. His criminal parents were killed by cops, so he turned to a life of crime. Anyway, it's his actions that lead to Leanne's death and forces the heroes to let him go or he'll kill even more innocents. Green Arrow encourages the rest of the League to let him go, but then hunts down and kills him. Now I mean he indirectly killed a little girl, but there's always been collateral damage. For Arrow to go and kill him now because it impacts the lives of people he knew, like his former ward who he wouldn't even help when he found out he was on drugs, no it was Hal who helped, but now he'll kill for his loss? Not only over the line, but selfish. But Cry for Justice is from 2009. Lots of edgy stuff is happening then. Although some of you may be with Arrow in this, it all got retconned away anyway. But Leanne never came back. Sadness. Number 8. Reed joining the Illuminati. Really anyone who joined the Illuminati. The Illuminati was a secret Marvel team comprised in its first iteration of Namor, Tony Stark, Reed Richards, Black Bolt, Professor X, and Doctor Strange. So why did I single out Reed? There's reasons, wait for it. The Illuminati wanted to find a way to deal with impending global threats or universal threats before they happened, a secret advanced squad who would decide the best course of action for everybody. Reed's solution to this was to go get the Infinity Gauntlet, or the stones for it rather, the gem which he was planning to wish out of existence. Upon finding he couldn't, he divided up the gems amongst the members. No more gauntlets for Reed. So many Reeds on the Council of Reeds had gauntlets. All of these behind the scenes machinations would play into secret invasion and civil war. For all the repercussions this group ended up having, and what a dictatorial combination they would prove to be later on, yes, Reed and the Illuminati went too far. Number 7. Wolverine kills Hank Pym. Time travel is a tricky thing, and when you mess with it, you had better be prepared for the fallout. In the 616 comic version, Hank Pym is the creator of Ultron, the sentient android who would grow to be one of the big villains in the Marvel Universe. So in 2013, it had actually succeeded in conquering the Earth of an alternate universe. This storyline was called Age of Ultron, or AU for short, which works because in fandom AU stands for alternate universe, so layers. The heroes of this conquered world end up finding a time travel solution, and Wolverine would be the one to go back and attempt it. Why? Because they have poor judgement. Also he kind of forced their hand. Wolverine's solution was just to kill Pym before he could finish his work. The only thing is this ended up having a ripple effect and making the timeline worse and threatening the entire multiverse. The other heroes warned him about this. This is why Cyclops has to be so abrasive. Wolverine never listens to him. Nearly redestroying the world and messing up the multiverse because you wouldn't listen to others? Going too far. Number 6. Daredevil kills Bullseye. Death. Death everywhere. This happened in the 2010 storyline Shadowland. This story featured a dark daredevil just returning from Japan, which in Marvel always makes you brutal. Just look at Wolverine or Ronin. He decides to use the hands techniques to keep Hell's Kitchen safe, parts of which had been destroyed during the Dark Reign storyline by Bullseye. So he would seek Bullseye out and kill him in the same manner that Bullseye had killed Elektra years prior, stabbed right through the heart, all while wearing his new dark evil looking ninja black daredevil outfit. Daredevil has also killed the Kingpin, after which he stood over the body and told the approaching news crews, I tried everything else. Of course, everybody got better and Daredevil would go back to his code and an attempt to be better than the criminals he pursues. And I for one am glad, Dark Daredevil is scary. Brutally murdering your enemies in front of people? Too far. That's anti-hero stuff. Number 5. Jon Stewart kills Mogo. Let's get some love for some other Green Lanterns going too far. It can't always be Hal murdering the core and snapping Sinestro's neck. So back during all the War of Light emotion spectrum stuff that was going on, Jon Stewart had an indigo ring. So compassion. Him and Kyle Rayner, who had the blue ring of hope, were facing off against Mogo, who had been corrupted by Krona. Long story short, he was trying to free the entities that powered the rings. It was a whole thing. The point? Mogo delivers rings to new recruits, and he was being corrupted and sending out corrupted ones, sucking Landry's into his gravitational pull, everything. So John Stewart, compassionate soul that he is, decides there's no other way except to channel black energy, the energy of death, and destroy Mogo, all while Kyle is begging him to find another way. This is one of those we need drama 
drama moments. Because you get the cool panel of Mogo exploding, which does look good. There are no stakes, Mogo is fine. But for not even trying to find another way, even while wielding the Ring of Compassion, too far. Though some would say necessary. Number four, Professor X erasing Vulcan. There were so many choices for Professor X, but I decided on this one because of the implications and ripple effects. Vulcan is the sibling of Havoc and Cyclops that they never knew about. Vulcan was abducted from his mother's corpse and hyper aged in an induction chamber. He's not okay. So extremely long story short, Vulcan was part of a wave of mutants sent by Professor X to Krakoa. It all goes wrong, and so Xavier wipes the memory of Vulcan and the mission from everyone's minds. This was especially significant for Cyclops, who would learn that he had a brother and that his existence had been kept from him for his own good. A lot of this has been retconned in terms of the how and the why in Welk Krakoa, but the mind wipe remains. And it was part of the big rift of mistrust that formed between Cyclops and Professor X, and we know where that led. Magneto was right, killing Xavier, mutant Hitler. So erasing people minds for their own good, which means deciding what is good for them too far. And how many times has he done this? How many more retcons are we going to pull out? Number three, Batman kills the KG beast. Batman doesn't kill anymore, not since the golden age you cry. But oh no, there are pockets, stories here and there where Batman finds he must take a life. And the KG beast arc was one of them. Although like everyone else, he got better. I just want someone to stay dead. Is that too much to ask? I'll get a crowbar. In this arc, the KG beast was sent by the Soviets to assassinate Ronald Reagan. So Batman knows that if he captures captures the KG Beast, well, he'll just go back to Russia and nothing will happen. So he lures him into a death trap in the sewer. When the KG Beast offers him the chance to fight to the death, he just shuts him in the sewer, leaving him there to starve to death. Cold. Ice cold. This was even before Jason died, but seeing this, can we really be surprised by how Jason turned out? He was watching people starve to death in the sewer. Only he didn't, so it's fine, I guess. Number two, Civil War II. All of it and everybody in it. So this drama about whether or not the inhuman with precognitive abilities, Ulysses, should be used to preempt crimes was a mess, and everybody went too far. So behind the scenes, writers only had at most four months to plan this entire event, and it shows. Motivations are weak, and characters suffer because of it. Carol Danvers becomes a complete fascist, who gets many heroes on her side killed. Hawkeye would be convinced to kill Bruce Banner by Bruce Banner. Rick Jones would die. Carol would beat Tony into a coma. And none of it mattered. Unlike the first Civil War, which had stakes for everyone, like immediate stakes, while this arc could have had the same thing if it was presented differently, it didn't happen because it was presented as, oh no, my boyfriend died, and I don't want to feel that way again. Arrest everyone before they do anything. Versus Tony being like, hey, that's bad, don't do that. Didn't you learn from what I did in the first Civil War? Don't be me. It's just all the heroes fighting amongst themselves and was very poorly received. So what could be worse than that? Why the first time this happened? Number one, Civil War. War. So this was supposed to be a story where both sides would have valid points and we should all come away enriched. Nope. <sighs> Let's go through some of the things. So Tony manipulated Spider-Man to revealing a secret identity, then bailed out when there were repercussions. Him and Reed constructed a secret interdimensional prison in the negative zone where they housed criminals and superheroes who wouldn't register. This was mostly Reed. Captain America arranged a meeting between the two where he was like, what if we just took them out. They were best friends before this, by the way. This arc was in no way nuanced. From the start, it was just Tony is wrong and Cap is right. And then Tony lived down to that. Also, even in how it first escalated, with Cap being declared a traitor because Maria Hill asks him if he's here for all this registration. And he mentions no because he lived through World War II and has seen what registering can do. Then she just declares him a traitor and pulls gunmen on him. Gunmen who were already waiting, by the way. Also, Reed and Hank Pym made a clone of Thor so that they could have a brute member for their side since Thor was dead and they had just recently shot the Hulk into space. No one looks good here. Everyone went too far. This would lead to things like one more day and just a mess all around. It also deserves number one because it failed to deliver on its promise of being a thought provoking nuanced event. You have to pull out of it to discuss the nuance because the comic sure doesn't. It's too bad because it really is an interesting issue. So those were 10 times Superman kills Zod. No, not that one time. No, Clark has killed Zod before. There was a precedent, but not as a member of the Next Snap Club. So in the 1980s, John Byrne rebooted Superman. In the comic, his origin was retold. Some characterizations were also tweaked. It was more of a tonal shift than anything. It was a new era for the Man of Steel. He was a different man, not the super jerk of the Silver Age and Early Bronze Age. This new origin was actually far more in line with the 1978 movie and its 1980 sequel that also featured Zod. It was particularly in line when it came to depictions of Krypton. So Clark, 
Mark, when he learned of other Kryptonians and their histories and about Zod, decided that he was going to carry out the sentences that had been handed down to them. And so he executed Zod in the Phantom Zone with Green Kryptonite. And then he proceeded to have much angst about it. He even exiled himself to space, because you know, death matters. So this went too far because, well, it took Superman out of commission. The Earth was just there because of this. I mean, he could have just left them in the zone. Zod came back anyway via retcon, so way to waste a death. Number 9. Flashpoint Barry Allen So Flashpoint is the event that leads directly into the New 52, and it was all started off because Barry decided he had to go save his mom. Now on one level, that's super sweet, but on another, was he replaced by a pod person? When you're a superhero who deals in the mystic and the super science on the regular, you know that time travel is not something you should just mess around with. It always has zany consequences. It's never something little like, oh, cinnamon rolls are now the national dish. It's always, oh, you're not the Flash, and Bruce Wayne Wayne died, and Atlantis and Themyscira are about to destroy each other and the world. So yeah, Barry created a separate timeline that even erased his protege Wally West from existence, along with so many kids and families, as his mom was dead. He was clearly not following the Vulcan creed about the needs of the many. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, or the one. Unless it's your mom, am I right? Up top. Number 8. Spider-Man rips off a face for Kane Spider-Man, Peter Parker, and Kane have an interesting relationship. Kane is one of his clones from the Clone Saga, and was initially a crazed, unstable killer capable of the mark of Cain, which is where he used acid hands to burn off people's faces. So it would come as a shock to some that during the Spider-Man Grim Hunt, Cain would end up sacrificing himself for Peter, who was being hunted by the family of Craven, the hunter. And Peter was wearing his black costume at the time, so you know what that means, he's hyper aggressive. So he hunts down Craven's daughter, well the whole family, but he ends up ripping off her face as a kinda, that's for you Cain, all for you buddy, best clone, I took her face off. Just intense. This is one of those modern black symbiote suit stories, so they're upping the ante quite a bit. Number 7. Booster Gold, The Gift Another time traveler abusing their power. Look, time travel really just needs to be given to voyeurs, just people who are not going to mess with stuff. Do you want to wake up with fish hands? Because this is how you wake up with fish hands. So the gift storyline for many was when they started to question is Tom King okay? This started in Batman 45, in the lead up to the Bat-Cat wedding that never happened. Booster got Bruce a gift, a horrible alternate timeline, because he made it so that Bruce Wayne's parents didn't die in an alley. Listen, Booster, there are some heroes who can have their origins altered and some who can't. Superman, Batman, over at Marvel Spider-Man, leave them alone. The effects of this timeline were weird too. There was still a Batman, but it was Dick Grayson, and Selina couldn't speak for some reason and was all hisses and grunts. It sure was a story that I read. Time travel plots are hard to pull off, and they're not all created equal. There are so many at this point that when one flops or is just meh, it stands out. Booster, next time just get him a normal gift like a tie or a coupon from massage. Number 6. Daredevil Becomes Kingpin So Daredevil has been fighting crime in Hell's Kitchen for quite some time now, and sometimes it gets to him. It's all too much. Such was the case during the Bendis run when he came to Hell's Kitchen, beat Kingpin within an inch of his life, and went, look at me. I'm the kingpin now. That's right, he took over Hell's Kitchen. Now some of you may be saying, earned, how is this going too far? Well, it was the fallout. Like all the gangs or even the kingpin were going to just take this lying down, not likely. So there was a lot of collateral damage from this, and Matt would even have his identity revealed. It was all really just a lot of a lot. It's a favorite arc for many, but still too far, Matty, too far. Number 5. Spider-Man Stabbed Deadpool So Spider-Man and Deadpool had a team-up series, Spider-Man Slash Deadpool and for a period versus when they weren't on as good terms. It ran for 50 issues. So during this whole thing, which largely occurred because of the pair's popularity as a ship, people love them some Spidey Pool, and the comic does at times pander, but back to the point. Deadpool is bending over backwards to prove to Spidey what a good person he is and that he deserves his friendship. He is to the point where he's willing to be a punching bag for Peter's issues. Peter, well, he's working through some things, including feeling like part of his life is wrong or missing. Thanks, Mephisto. And at one point when he's careening more into violence and Deadpool calls him out for it, he stabs him right through the chest. He actually kills him, but it's Deadpool so he gets better. Peter played pretty fast and loose with Deadpool's healing factor in this series. Stabbing your friends? Too far. Number 4. Professor X Fakes His Own Death So we have so many Professor X moments to choose from, and I went with this early one. It's a classic from Uncanny X-Men number 42, where Professor X dies in the arms of his devastated X-Men, but psych, he wasn't actually dead. The X-Men, these teens and young adults, just go it alone for 20 issues. Then Professor X just shows back up and was like, 
I was in the basement. He hid in the basement the entire time, cause he was planning for an alien invasion. The person who actually died was Changeling, a reformed villain who wanted to redeem himself before dying of a terminal illness. So Professor X was like, wanna help me fake my own death? Hero style? So two things, you could just have told them to leave you alone and then subtly push them to do it with your powers if you really needed them to never bother you. Two, you could read their thoughts like all that morning from the basement the entire time or just like, nope, I'm staying down here. That's cold. Number three, Reed, the Council of Reeds. So you've heard about the Council of Reeds, where Reed joined up with a bunch of other versions of himself. So this council was formed by three Reeds, all with infinity gauntlets, and eventually the 616 Reed joined. But all these Reeds ended up in a battle with Celestials, and most of the Reeds died in this battle. Now our Reed deactivated the bridge after finding he couldn't give up his family the way the others had. So well, how is this too far? Well, he didn't tell his family, and one day his daughter Valeria snuck into the lab and reactivated the bridge. And so there were like four Reeds who had survived and they crossed over and died. Tell your family things so they don't accidentally open portals to other worlds and unleash evil. Number two, Miss Marvel and the Teenage Gestapo. So Miss Marvel got pulled into Civil War II just like everyone else, but in her book, it got weird. Now Miss Marvel really looks up to Carol Danvers. She used to want to be her, hence her taking on her name when she got her embiggened Terrigen Mist powers. But when Carol shows up in her books, it's for Civil War II purposes and to tell her to be part of what's basically a Teenage Gestapo. You know, Ulysses predicting crimes before they happen, Minority Report. So basically it's a group of teens going around and policing their friends and neighbors, arresting them, taking them from their homes, and taking them to a warehouse prison outside the town. And at first Miss Marvel is like, let's do this, and yup, people get arrested. Even people that she knows personally, and it's just this whole arc. She eventually backs out, but she's still scarily loyal to Carol. She will lie to her family and beyond for her, and Carol makes her. It's just, did people think the implications of all this through? The worst part about this and why both she and it went too far is that it derailed the book. This event just stopped it cold and it took a while to get back on track. It's a bad look. So what's worse than arresting your friends before they can do anything because you're just following orders? Well, number one, Wally West, Heroes in Crisis. Murder. So just everything with Heroes in Crisis vacillated so much. Some of it was really good, and some of it was really terrible. So Heroes in Crisis was largely a murder mystery, so spoilers. But we finally discovered that the person who killed all the people at the secret sanctuary therapy session location was Wally West, a love flash from the late 80s and early 90s, who Dan Didio has been trying to kill for at least a decade. Wally read through all the patient files of the sanctuary at once, even though the files were supposed to be deleted, and all of that angst and out of characterness for some of the people made him go insane. He lashed out and killed a bunch of them, heroes and villains alike. Then he time traveled to kill himself later in the timeline to bring that corpse back to cover it up so it looked like he died too. Ladies and gentlemen, the hero who brought us Rebirth. This whole thing was just a slap in the face for Wally fans, and for many it felt like forced pathos, and just too far. Wally was a hero and a kind soul, it just all felt very contrived. Lots of Heroes in Crisis does, and some of the continuity is really wonky. Now some people love this arc, and that's great. Everyone is approaching comics from a different stance and perspective, but as someone who has had Wally as the Flash their entire life until Barry's rebirth in the early 2000s, hashtag not my Wally. So those